This is a great mission. It's telling us to take the time to tell those stories so we can honor the heroes of the past who endured tremendous injustice. And not only that, it encourages us to take an active role now in recognizing injustice and taking action against it. Tonight, we'll be talking about the three official Network to Freedom Trail sites that we have right here in St. Mary's County. Um, and then we will also be talking about a recent work of historical fiction that ties together our local history and the mission of the network. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with the bigger picture, which we can find here on the National Park Service website. The Underground Railroad's most famous conductor, of course, is Harriet Tubman, um, and she lived on the eastern shore of Maryland. But the network extended well, well beyond that area. This network is made up of over 650 sites across 39 states, and it shows many facets of the struggle for freedom in our country. From this website, you can see maps and lists of all the locations, as well as take virtual tours of many of them. So it makes it very accessible. I'll be sending you the link to this site in our follow-up material, and I hope you have a chance to go check it out. Um, so that is the big picture. Now let's turn the spotlight on our local sites. Please advance the slide. Um, here we have St. Mary's County, and each of the stars shows you the three locations. We're going to be starting with historic Sodderley. We have Jeannie Pirtle. You can just wave so we know who we Thanks, Judy. Um, she is the education director from Historic Sodderly, and she is going to be talking about origin stories um, of many of those who sought their freedom dur during the War of 1812. Welcome, Jeannie. Um, second, we are going to Leonardtown right here with the historic old jail. And we have Karen Stone, who is the County Museum Division. Uh, she'll be talking about what happened to some of those freedom seekers who were recaptured as well as some of the allies who are trying to help them. Welcome, Karen. Our third location, which is down at the southern tip of St. Mary's County, is uh, Point Lookout State Park. And we have historian Katie Davis with us. And she'll be telling us the stories of the people who passed through Point Lookout seeking their freedom during the Civil War. Uh, welcome, Katie. And lastly, we'll be talking to award-winning author Wayne Carlin, who has written numerous books of both fiction and nonfiction that range in topics from the beginnings of St. Mary's City to his experiences in the Vietnam War. Tonight, we'll be talking about his most recently published book, which is entitled A Wolf by the Ears. And this is a work of historical fiction um, that is placed right here in St. Mary's County. It names exact places like Washington Street and Leonardtown. Um, and it takes place right in the heart of the history that we're going to be discussing tonight. So welcome, Wayne. Okay, so if we could advance the slide, please. Uh, our first stop on our tour is Historic Sodderly. Um, and Jeannie, uh, this is, when we think of the Underground Railroad, we often think of Harriet Tubman, as I mentioned, and stops along the way of the Underground Railroad, but the story with Historic Sodderly is a little bit different. Um, and you told me that these are origin stories. Uh, so what are we talking about with origin stories? Right, so uh, when people think of the Underground Railroad, they think, um, you know, when they go to a site, here's a place they hid or a cellar or a basement or some place like that is what people usually picture. But Historic Satterley is on uh, the Network to Freedom site because we have so many stories of flight and resistance of um, people that took their freedom, sought their freedom from Sodderley. So Sodderley was a place, you know, it was a, a major plantation, slave holding plantation. So it was a place people were trying to get away from and leave uh, to seek their freedom. So uh, it, it, um, sometimes that surprises people. People ask me is, you know, where, where did they hide? Um, and uh, it also, um, you know, some of the families helped, um, you know, they, they, some, they had to visit the relatives maybe in secret uh, without permission, which was very dangerous. And so they knew, they knew the trails and uh, paths uh, around the county 
and they had a whole network to help each other um, uh, seek their freedom. Oh, so okay. that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the um, reasons, you know, we have um, examples of people that sought their freedom from um, the 18th and the 19th centuries. Um, in the War of 1812, it was a little bit different in that uh, whole families sought their freedom and went with the British. So that, that was um, uh, a little bit uh, atypical. Usually it was uh, someone that uh, wasn't, didn't have a, a spouse or children. Um, you know, if you have, if you're a father of 12 children um, and you're older, it depends on your health. So this, this was an exception. Uh, and we did, we do, did have an example of uh, someone that landed in jail, but it was the Prince George's County Jail, and that was during the 19th century. Okay. And uh, so, so if if the if the uh, if the slaveholder didn't uh, pay the fee for uh, the enslaved person to uh, be returned then they were uh, they could be sold and that was an even worse fate than um, being returned because uh, the fear was being sold south yes now let's, okay now let's watch our video tour so we can see all of the grounds at Sodderley um, with Judy so hello this is Jeannie from historic Sodderley so if you look at, this is one of our interpretive signs, uh, and I picked this spot because it, um, it has a runaway ad from March 6, 1791. Uh, so all of the years uh, and the centuries during slavery, um, suddenly has people who uh, took their freedom freedom seekers. This actually talks about um, there were whole families during the War of 1812, which went from 1812 to 1815. Um, there were whole families from Sodderley, the Corsis, the Seelys, the Youngs, that uh, took their freedom, that left with the British, whole families, men, women, and children. Some of them ended up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, where they received um, uh, uh, some land, but it was harsh. Uh, uh, just because they had taken their freedom didn't mean they were free from racism mm. and discrimination. Um, and two, do you trust the British? Because during the revolution, not, you know, they promised freedom to those that would help the British but they didn't live up to their promises all the time. So Historic Sodderley is on several different trails, historical trails, but we are on the Star Spangled Banner National Historic Trail uh, uh, because we there were so, so many that took flight. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, the British wasn't, uh, offering freedom that it, it was not totally unselfish. Uh, it disrupted life here in Southern Maryland uh, when uh, they took what they considered their property and disrupted uh, commerce. And was that, was that a successful strategy for the British um, to, you know, like entice the enslaved people to join them? Yes, uh, it changed the trajectory of Sodaly's history because after 1812, um, they went from 64, uh, holding 64 enslaved people uh, to 16. I mean, uh, they lo totally lost the labor force, so it, it, it caused um, the last George Crater to sell the property. So it definitely uh, changed Soderley's history. And that's one of the reasons people um, you know, big reasons that people sought their freedom. I mean, um, you could you could risk having your child sold off or your hus husband. You know, who, it's it's traumatic. Mm. Um, it's brutal. 
So many chose uh, the, to risk their lives to have freedom instead. One thing that um, some people may not realize is that a lot of the freedom seekers worked in the slaveholders' households. Hmm. Um, they were trusted. They they had the manners of the slaveholder. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they heard what slaveholders family said all the time uh, but it in Soderley's history uh, uh, there were the, the uh, freedom seekers that that left Soderley were those trusted household servants and enslaved um, that left uh -huh. um, so um, Oh, so they developed skills yes. while they were in the house. So, the, so they developed those skills. And so uh, there were a, a few um, hands that left that we know of, field hands, but mainly it was um, these really valued uh, by the slaveholder, I mean, monetarily valued, because they, um, they had all these, these skills. So which building are we in front of, Jean? This is the corn crib building. This is the land lies in the land. Okay, let's go inside. So this covers um, those that were held enslaved at Farley. This is a known list known enslaved and the the people that I talked about that sought their freedom are also on this list. The page we have Okay, it. so you have a movie that you can watch on your YouTube page? Yes. It's this one? It's called The Choice. And uh, during 1812 Mania, I call it, <laughs> uh, we had a script written and um, about the enslaved in uh, in 1812 who sought their freedom. It's how did enslaved people resist? So this is a good panel here. Um, this is another uh, freedom seeker. His name is Tower Hill. Okay, He's about 25. And these are <laughs> these these ads ran in the newspaper. Yes, correct? this is put by George Plater. So this is 1786. So this is George Plater the third. So that's wow. Governor Plater. Okay. All right. I see this nice quote here by Agnes Kane Callum. Um, in terms of Soderley, it's very important to have the complete history because nowhere on this property can you walk or look and not see the fruits of the work of the people of color who were enslaved here. And who is Agnes Callum? Agnes Callum. Kane Callum. Uh, traced her ancestry uh, back to Savoy to the Kane family that were held here uh, enslaved uh, during the Briscoe period, the 19th century. And um, she was an avid researcher and genealogist, and uh, she brought her family to Savoy back in the 70s and uh, helped to um, tell the story. You know, uh, basically, it was uh, it, it's a colonial revival site that tells the white narrative, and she helped to change that and tell the story of her family and her people. So, if you go to sure. another point that that's important to say, a lot of times I'll get visitors who say, "Well, why didn't they run away?" Um, because people have choices. People are individuals. So some people had impossible choices. Um, if you were a uh, an older man and you had a dozen children at Sodderley, 
you're probably less likely to run and take flight than a younger man that's not tied down to a family yet. Um, and uh, an exception to that is our 1812 story where whole families left with the British. But it's, it's not because they didn't resist. They just resisted in different ways. Mm, that's an excellent um, there's point. more, there's more ways to resist than, than running off. So, um, <clears throat> they still resisted. Um, but, uh, in network to freedom, they're looking at people that took flight, uh, mainly is what, what mm. their story is about. Um, but I get that question a lot it's oh, because people that. have different choices and some of these choices are impossible choices. Mm -hmm. um, um, you have to remember that, that they're individuals. So they have, they have different choices to make and their circumstances are different. Mm -hmm. So just. Oh, well, thank you, Jeannie. That was a great tour. Of, um, of historic Soderley. And if, um, if you would like to learn more about historic Soderley, Jeannie Pirtle actually has this book um, that you can check out from the library, or I'm sure you can find it on uh, book selling options as well, uh, that you can learn a lot more about um, Soderley, historic Soderley. So um, that is the origin story of like what the lives were like for some of the enslaved people. Uh, and some had, it, like circumstances worked out that they could try to get away, uh, but they weren't always successful. So that brings us to the next stop on our, our tour of the Network to Freedom Trail. Um, if we could advance the slide, please. And that brings us to the old jail. Uh, so Karen, um, what, how does the old jail fit into the Network to Freedom Trail? Well, jail retells the story of the unsuccessful side of things in St. Mary's County. The people that were unsuccessful in running away, um, people that tried to help the slaves that were running away. There were actually nine people arrested in St. Mary's County, we have documented so far, who were arrested for crimes relating to slavery. There were five freedom seekers and four abolitionists who helped the freedom seekers. Two women and two men, one white woman, one born slave but freed black woman, and then two soldiers. And the others were slaves that had tried to run away. Um, a couple of them did escape um, and managed to get out of the jail but were caught again and returned. The jail was also used as a holding pen for people uh, or for slaves if they had come to, if the, the plantation owners had come to Leonardtown to a slave sale and had purchased the slave but weren't immediately going home, they could pay the jailer to keep the slave overnight in the jail or for a few hours in the jail. So. Sometimes the slaves spent time in jail, even though they hadn't done anything wrong. They were oh just held there. Okay. Well, so, oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting story. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but there were others that were held there because they had tried to run away. Um, and we know the sheriff used a lot of local people to help catch slaves um, and bring them to jail and hold them until uh, their owners could could come and fetch them. So it's a, it's, you know, Jeannie's got the worst sad story because it suddenly is where they actually were enslaved. But then the, the old jail is the next worst because they're the failed stories. So we don't ever like to tell that, but, yes. but that's what was going on at the old jail. Well, on, the, on that note, why don't we go take the tour? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm Karen Stone, the Museum Division Manager for St. Mary's County, and we're here today at the Old Jail Museum in Leonardtown. This jail was built in 1876, which is 12 years after slavery ended in Maryland. 
and it was building number six of, the, of eight jails here in St. Mary's County. So it did not specifically play a role in the Underground Railroad, but it's built exactly on the spot of jail number five, where eight of our nine people were held that were arrested for charges relating to slavery. The very first person arrested that we know of was Lily Cooper, who was arrested in 1828 for harboring a slave. She herself had been born into slavery and was freed when her mistress died and then set up her own house and apparently helped a number of runaway slaves or freedom seekers as we now call them. She was held in jail building number three, which was across Washington Street from where we are now. And that building had been built in 1800. She ended up serving four full years for having harbored a slave. The next abolitionist to be arrested was arrested, she was arrested in 1860, and her name was Sarah McMahon. She was a white woman. She was sentenced to six and a half years for harboring a runaway, but after serving only a few weeks, was given a full pardon by the governor. It's a whole different story for her. The building that sat on this site held the majority of our folks. There were five freedom seekers who were arrested and held her here between 1858 and 1864. Rivas or George, Alonzo, George Scriber, John, and Tom. Now George broke jail and was never captured. Alonzo, George, and John, we assume, will return to their masters. Tom also escaped, but he was arrested along with a man named Randolph Taylor. Now Randolph was in the military, he was an African American, he had come down to this area with a regiment out of Maine. He was arrested for enticing enslaved women and children away from their masters, and also thievery. He stole a horse and cart, we assume, to take his his uh, folks to freedom. He was put in jail here along with Tom, and they both escaped, and they were never recovered. Then there was another soldier whose name was Randolph Aaron, who also had come down from Maine, was an African American, and he was imprisoned here, and apparently charged with the same thing. Again, needed the horse and cart to carry away the folks that he was in time trying to entice away from their masters. We do not know if he was held for his entire term or what happened. That all happened in 1864, the same year that slavery was abolished in Maryland. So perhaps little patients would have kept these people from being in prison, but they were held here. This building was built in 1876, like I said because of the number of escapes from the previous building. That building was just one story, there was no living jailer, and apparently the border was not very secure because the stories are that they just took the stones out, moved them out of the way, and ran. So this building was built as a two-story building. The cells are on the second floor. The jailer lived on the first floor, so there were no more escapes after this building was constructed. Like I said, this is building number six of eight here in the county. The first one was actually built in um, 1663, shortly after the county was founded. So there have been a whole series of jails. This is the one in which we're now able to tell all these stories of people that were in prison in the, the many years of our history of the Justice Department here in St. Mary's. Oh, well, thank, oh, you, well, thank Karen. you, Karen. So that, that is the story of our old jail in Leonardtown. Um, so the last stop that we're going to make on the Network to Freedom Trail uh, will be our next slide, which is Point Lookout. Um, so some of the people were unsuccessful and ended up in the jail. Um, and Katie 
Can you tell us a couple of the, the things, like alternative things that may have happened for some of these freedom seekers that are played out here in Point Lookout? Yeah, of course. So Point Lookout is uh, where the General Hammond Hospital was built in 1862, and then Camp Hoffman was built um, in the following year of 1863. Um, it was a prisoner of war camp for Confederate soldiers. Um, also significant about this peninsula at the time was that there were multiple ways that freedom seekers actually sought uh, their freedom behind Union lines there. So one of these ways was what uh, was called the Time of Contraband Camp, which existed just outside of Camp Hoffman, where many freedom seekers actually lived in that period during the Civil War after having escaped from plantations in both Virginia and Maryland. Um, another way was the, and, and being, um, actually enlisting then in the United States Colored Troops. Um, and there were, um, I think, I believe two regiments that were actually stationed as guards at the um, prisoner of war camp. And then there were also um, multiple nurses and doctors at the um, general hospital on the peninsula, such as Abigail Hopper Gibbons that you see pictured here, who are actually abolitionists and um, helped multiple um, freedom seekers uh, during this period. So <laughs> that's great. Well, let's go take the tour. Davis, and today we are here at Point Lookout State Park. Um, today, now it's a uh, beautiful state park. You know, we can go camping and hiking and fishing. However, back in the Civil War in the 1860s, this was actually site of two significant things. First, in 1862, the federal government decided to build the General Hammond Hospital in, uh, right here on the peninsula, although now it is underwater due to erosion. And second, in 1863, the federal government built the uh, Camp Hoffman, which was actually one of the largest prisoner of war camps for Confederate soldiers um, during the war. So what you see right now is what the state park has erected in signifying the uh, prisoner of war camp. Um, but also this site is very significant um, regarding the Underground Railroad, which is what we're gonna be talking about mostly today. Um, not only was uh, there also a contraband camp on this site just outside of the prisoner of war camp, but also many notable figures were involved in um, helping freedom seekers from Virginia and Maryland, including many of the nurses and doctors at Hammond Hospital. So right now I'm actually standing on what was once a Civil War era road in the camp. So it would have connected um, all the way down to the Pacific Peninsula, where the prisoner of war camp was, Camp Boston, and the General Hammond Hospital, all the way down to the contraband camp um, outside of the prisoner of war camp. Uh, so actually the contraband camp was a place where freedom seekers from across Maryland and Virginia would come to seek refuge behind um, Union lines during the Civil War. Contraband itself actually means confiscated enemy property. So that is what Union officials would actually um, call freedom seekers who were seeking refuge here. Um, they actually came from um, all over the area by thousands. So the freedom seeker status was actually uncertain and there was a difference between freedom seekers from Virginia and Maryland as freedom seekers from Virginia were protected by the Emancipation Proclamation and those in Maryland were not. Um, so this, the conditions of the camp were actually very poor. Um, we know this from the letters of several of the nurses down at General Hammond Hospital. Um, one in particular, uh, Abigail Hopper Gibbons, uh, actually spent a lot of time uh, around the contraband camp and noted that sometimes their rations were cut in half um, and conditions were pretty miserable. Um, but she also noted moments of joy as in uh, where she noted that um, one woman was actually able to give birth in the camp. Um, so, you know, this was a, a place where freedom seekers came and um, was an important stop along the Underground Railroad. Uh, so another common way for um, freedom seekers to escape bondage uh, near and around Maryland and Virginia was actually to join the United States Colored Troops. And multiple troops were actually stationed here at Point Lookout in which um, black uh, freedmen and freedom seekers would actually guard the prison atop of gates like this, um, in charge of making sure none of the prisoners escaped. This was actually very significant as because it was a pretty significant role reversal at the time. Um, and that wasn't lost on many of the Confederate prisoners who actually noted uh, between journal entries and various drawings that 
um, they uh, were, you know, they noted that the roles had been reversed and now these black soldiers were guarding them. Um, so this was actually very common that um, uh, freedom seekers would join the United States Colored Troops. Um, yeah, and some were stationed right here at Point Lookout. Okay, so as you can see on this map here, we started out in the prisoner of war camp. Then um, this is where the contraband camp used to be, and now we're over here along the edge of the peninsula, where right down the beach was the General Hammond Hospital, which I mentioned earlier. The hospital is now underwater, but was actually uh, very significant for its time, given its um, architecture and the way it was set up. Um, additionally, we have um, lots of accounts from nurses and doctors down there who are actually very significant in helping the freedom seekers that came to the peninsula in escaping behind those Union lines. Um, they also helped many Maryland freedom seekers before um, the Emancipation Proclamation or even during the Emancipation Proclamation that um, were not protected by it yet. So one of these nurses, um, her name was Abigail Hopper Gibbons, and I mentioned her earlier um, when we were talking about the details of the contraband camp. She was um, born in Pennsylvania and was actually an abolitionist her entire life, um, following in the footsteps of her father. Um, so when the Civil War came around, she enlisted and was stationed here at Hammond Hospital, um, where she actually significantly um, helped many freedom seekers escape bondage from Maryland and Virginia. Um, notably in her letters, she spoke of two in particular um, who she helped, um, and those shackles are actually now at a museum in New York. So uh, that's pretty interesting. She also helped um, another man who was unfortunately recaptured by um, uh, slaveholders in Maryland, but um, she was an amazing woman and did a lot um, to help the freedom seekers in this area. So, so in 1848, um, a bit before the Civil War, there was another incident involving freedom seekers here at Point Lookout. Um, in 1848, a schooner by the name of the Pearl actually carried 77 fugitive slaves or freedom seekers down from Washington, D.C an attempt to escape the bonds of slavery. Um, captain Daniel Drayton was the uh, captain of the ship, um, but actually in April, uh, the ship captain was forced to um, hide in the Point Lookout Creek, um, in which the 77 freedom seekers were captured and um, returned to their slaveholders in Washington, D.C. or sold, um, most likely in a market nearby. Um, so that's just another incident um, involving freedom seekers here at Point Lookout. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was a really great tour of Point Lookout. Um, okay, so now we're going to depart a little bit from just the straight history and move into historical fiction, uh, which is one of my favorite genres of, of literature, uh, because I think well-written historical fiction gives us a chance to not only learn the history, but then also kind of feel a personal connection with the people who lived at the time, uh, because the author gives us a plausible look into like what their thoughts and feelings might have been like. Um, so we're going to talk to award-winning author Wayne Carlin, who has published this book last year. Uh, the title of it is A Wolf by the Ears, and it is set right here in St. Mary's County um, during the War of 1812, and it is a story of freedom seekers from that era. Okay, welcome, Wayne. Could could we start by? Thank you. Uh -huh. If we could start, if you could give us a synopsis of the story, please. Sure. I was going to say, speaking of historical fiction, that, that photograph of me looks looks historic. <laughs> I'm, I'm much, much younger in that photograph, so thank you for that. Um, it, the, the A Wolf by the Ears is set within the rebellion of thousands of enslaved people from the plantations in the uh, Tidewater region. Southern Maryland and, and Virginia, who, uh, who rallied to the British after the British promised them uh, freedom during the War of 1812. The novel begins in Southern Maryland and uh, it ends in all places of, in uh, Trinidad. Uh, the three main characters are two enslaved people, Tower Hill, um, which is also the na a name I, I took from that advertisement, but it's nothing to do with the with the figure, the fugitive uh, slave in that advertisement, um, Sarai and their master, Jacob Hallam. Hallam's parents, they're slave owners, but uh, they believed in the education of slaves and 
wanted to prepare them for uh, Tower Hill and, and Sarai are purchased when they're very, very young and they're raised with Jacob in a, in a sibling type relationship, which of course erodes when they become adults and they get and they're in that relationship of master and slave. Um, that gulf is particularly abrasive to, to Tower Hill because Sarai becomes Jacob's mistress um, and lives in the manor house. Due to debts and impoverish, excuse me, impoverishment on plantation, Jacob plans to sell most of the slave population. Um, and before that happens, Tower Hill, who has been promised for him by the British, leads an insurrection and brings over the bulk of the slaves to the, uh, to the British. Sarai, because of her position, remains with Jacob because she's basically rejected by her own community. Um, at that point, the paths of these characters split and Tower Hill goes on to become a, a leader in the colonial Marines, which were the uh, black soldiers that were used by the British against the Americans. Uh, Jacob and, and Sarai become uh, involved in a kind of American guerrilla force fighting against the British. Uh, in Tower Hill's Odyssey, I mean, he gets to, um, with the colonial Marines, raid a lot of the places in St. Mary's um, and ends up going with the British forces to uh, the burning of, of the Capitol in the White House in Washington, the final battle um, in, in Baltimore Harbor, where Fort McHenry is, is uh, shelled. The, the war inevitably brings them all together and Sarai and Jacob are, are put into the um, hold of a, of a British prisoner ship while, uh, while uh, Tower Hill is still fighting with the British. And in that way, the, the, it kind of culminates with Sarai in the hold of that ship when uh, Fort McHenry is shelled. And of course, that's the inspiration for the Star Spangled Banner. And it's something in a novel I have her, you know, not, not witnessing at all because she's basically held in chains in the, in the belly of the ship. And um, that difference in the experience between Francis Scott Key and an enslaved person is something I wanted to emphasize. Um, that, you know, the rock is not something that'll be shared by Tower Hill or his people or Sarai for centuries to come. I, I really That's enjoyed basically the that, that I really enjoyed the book, Wayne, and it made me so interested in our local history. Um, I had to I had to drive down to the wharf in Leonardtown because I had a recollection that there was a marker down there, um, and and it was just exactly what you had in your book about them mar marching up Washington Street um, for the invasion of Leonardtown. So so it really got me more interested in our local history um, and just the issues of the time. So so I really I really enjoyed it. So it sounds like there is a lot of actual history in the story. Um, how much would you say is purely historical? The, the context and the background is uh, historical. I mean, there's obviously, I, it, obviously because it is fiction, I, I changed, for example, the, um, the plantation on which they live, which is named Tower Hill. In my mind, I, you know, I see Soderley and a lot of my research came from from uh, Dirk and others at, at Soderley, but there was never a, an insurrection, you know, at Soderley. That's something I, I invent for, for the novel. But the in terms of the, um, the conditions of the time, in terms of the history of the British um, invasion of Maryland and Washington and Baltimore, I pretty much stick to uh, the historical background, but obviously I put these characters into that, into that background. So things like the uh, Battle of Bladensburg and you know, the actual burning of the White House and Capitol, the uh, uh, burning of Barney's fleet, and you know, et cetera, all that is is actually historical, uh, as well as the locations of the slave markets and and that whole system. That's great. So, so what inspired you to write about these particular characters in this time and place? Uh, yeah, the, the title comes from um, Thomas Jefferson in a, in a letter he wrote, uh, talk, you know, basically explaining his position on slavery. 
And, and a lot of Jefferson's personality is something that I, I think about in writing the character of Jacob, even though he's, he's very different. So, you know, Jefferson, somebody who, uh, he, he knew slavery was wrong. You know, he, he had to know it, yet at the same time he held on to it. So the, the quote from the letter is, but as it is, we have the wolf, by, the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. We have the institution of slavery, and we let it go. Justice is on one scale, and self-preservation is on the other. So there's that, that tension between the ideology of freedom and equality, and the institution of slavery, which which so marks our history, you know, and the, and the fact I I live in this area where so much of this stuff took place, it just um, and and just as an American, I mean, it really appealed to me that that we we can see so much of the tension and contradiction of our history, the way it's you know the whole idea of freedom. Um, we look at the War of eighteen twelve. You know, normally in our in our history as as school kids, if we get it at all, you know, it's Francis Scott Key in the Star Spangled Banner, and fighting against the British again for liberty. Whereas for a whole segment of our of our people, freedom meant the opposite. Freedom meant to revolt against that, to go with the to go with the British, who promised and in large in large measure delivered their their freedom. Um, there's a, a verse, you, know, you talk about the, the Star Spangled Banner. There's a verse um, that we don't sing, right? But it goes, um, no refuge should, could save hireling in the slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph does wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. No refuge could save the hireling in the slave. He's talking specifically about the people that went over to the British and were fighting against the Americans in, in that war. Um, so tension, you know, that exists between the equality that, that exists and, you know, and was articulated in the Declaration of Independence and so on. Um, it led to a contradiction in our history that led to the Civil War and that we're still dealing with today. You know, we're clearly still dealing with today. And, you know, just as, as a not living in this region and, and, you know, seeing the geography of that and, you know, the landscape of all that is something that, that compelled me as a writer to try to tell the story in, in that way. Wow, that's really great. It is, it is kind of eye-opening when you're used to, like, having the narrative a certain way all the time to, to realize that there was this whole other aspect of it that you might not have really been aware of. So so I think works like this and preserving the stories historically uh, with each of you historians um, is really valuable to kind of carry it forward. Um, uh, I think I'll note right here that the, the reason that I chose to do this program this week is that uh, this Saturday is June 19th, which is, which mm -hmm. is Juneteenth, and that's the celebration of kind of the actual end of slavery in this country, because it commemorates when um, in Texas, there was a general announcement to all the people that slavery was, was now illegal. Like it wasn't clear to everybody kind of up until that point. Um, and that happened on June 19th. And um, just this week, the Senate has approved a bill uh, to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And it's gonna be called National Independence Day. So I think it's kind of kind of neat. It's doing a little bit of a catch up for where everybody was independent. Um, and an interesting note is that it was a unanimous decision by the Senate to approve that bill. So now it goes on to the House. And uh, that's quite a feat to get something unanimous in the Senate. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Well, um, we don't have any questions, but I think I'd just like to open it up to to all of you. Um, you know what what should we what should we bring forward? What should we take forward from this? Like like what actions can we make? We are the you're the preservers of history. Um, Wayne is the storyteller, and I'm the librarian. So we try to make the stories accessible to everybody. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, so. So what do we do to continue to make it better? What do you think? 
think we need to tell these stories in conjunction with each other. You know, Wayne's story is great. You can take it home and read it, but then you need to go out and visit the sites and see what other stories are at those sites and see how it all ties together. Because like Wayne mentioned, history tends to be taught in a vacuum and in a very linear manner. And it's not, it, it goes all over the place. It backs up on itself. It goes around in circles, it overlaps, it contradicts. So it's important, I think, that people go out and, and see, go to the local museums, stop on the wayside like you did at the wharf and read the panels. There are interpretive panels all over St. Mary's County. And they all tell different stories that all tie together. So I think I think panels like because it introduces people. But now go out and visit. We just had we're coming up on summer solstice. It's a great time of year to be outside. So go out, go read books and and see all these sites, and then talk about it. Talk to each other. Talk to us. Think about it. You know, maybe write your own story. I just uh, uh, last night heard someone someone say, and he happens to be the executive director of uh, uh, Maryland Center for History and Culture, the former Maryland Historical Society. He said, you know, they have thousands of things and objects and documents in, uh, and he was at Soderley, so uh, they have thousands of documents and objects at. Um, the center in Baltimore as it fills up a city block, he said. But what we have on the sites is the place where it happened. You know, it, it, they don't have the sense of place that um, an actual historic site does. So um, I thought that was excellent. And I'm going to use it. <laughs> oh, that is good. Oh, that, that actually is good. Can, actually, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, there, was, there is a question uh, for me in the chat about Benjamin Hans. Benjamin Hans was born free, as far as we know. So he comes into the jail for a whole different thing, totally unrelated to slavery. He was arrested, and Katie can correct me or back me up on this since she wrote the paper. Benjamin Hans was arrested for inappropriately approaching and talking to a young white woman. So he was taken into the jail. He was never granted a trial. The lynch mob broke in and took him out before it could come to trial and he was lynched. He's the only known and documented lynching victim in St. Mary's County. But he was actually held in the old jail museum, building number six of eight, that I was standing in front of and that you can come visit. You can go upstairs and stand in the cell in which he was held. But he's a post-slavery recon and everybody's trying to figure out how to get along with each other and they're having horrible issues. So he's a he's a post and not necessarily slavery issue. And I believe you're having a program about that in November, about Benjamin Hans at the old chair. Right, right. We did the soil collection ceremony on November 1st in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then this year we'll um, erect a historic marker for him. Um, and we picked November 1st because that's the date on which Maryland, um, slavery ended in Maryland before the Emancipation Proclamation when they changed the state constitution. Because be, since Maryland was not in rebellion, the Emancipation Proclamation did not sleep, free the slaves in Maryland. So it took the act of Congress or the legislature. Right. Um, oh, I actually have- I, I, would just add, oh, no, I would just add to that. I'm sorry that um, his example didn't take place during slavery as, as you say, certainly an example of, of the way that um, the system of white supremacy that allowed slavery spilled into the, in, into the, into the culture of the country afterwards and that we're, we're still dealing with. And one of the most important things I think people can take from this is um, not, 
we can't turn away from from our history. You know, it's not it's not unpatriotic to look at the at the flaws mm. in our history. It's it's the way we the way we move towards fixing them. And you know that the slavery did not end on June t- uh, Juneteenth. It ended officially, but but all all of that stuff, you know, that was only enabled by white supremacy continued and continued. Um, and that's what we got to work on. That's why we have to remember this stuff. Yes, that that's a great point, Wayne. It legally ended, but that was a long time ago, and we are still sort of dealing with the fallout from it. So we got to keep keep going. <laughs> so let me just oh um oh there was a question um is the map to all the historical is there a map to all the historical markers in the county um there is a a database of of all the historical markers and you can search it um, and i'll include the the link to that website in my follow-up materials we also have some some brochures that will help you start and if you get to one marker some of them lead to the next markers um but yeah the database is the best one and it depends on if you're talking the real historic markers you know the silver ones or are you looking for the civil civil war trail markers or are you looking for the interpretive panels there's a lot but if you come by in one of the sites or the visitor centers there's a lot of maps that will help you figure out where you're going yeah Okay, and let me just do, I want to do one. Um, Let me just end by telling you some other things that are happening. Uh, Tomorrow night, the library has another program. Um, It is an author talk with author Taya Miles. She wrote a nonfiction book about three generations of Black women and their struggle for freedom. Um, And that's tomorrow night at 6.30. You can go to the library website and register for that. Um, This weekend, just want to verify with Karen. Uh, the Drayden School has open house at 11 o'clock both days. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. And that's yes. the, that's the one of the best preserved African American schoolhouses in the country. Yes. And you can go visit that. And on the right side of the screen here is Juneteenth celebration, which is um, celebrating what we were talking about that Juneteenth has come to stand for. Um, that is also the Saturday. Uh, from noon to one, there's a virtual presentation. Uh, from one to three, that you can take tours at these various historical places around the county. Um, and they're able to have their live jazz uh, festival. It goes from four to six. I believe the music actually starts at five, but it is open at that time. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, and I'm, I'm just putting one one thing out there too, we're going to have Wayne Carlin back in November for an author talk um, in honor of Veterans Day. So that's that's out there on the horizon also. So that is everything I have, I believe. Yes, we got the questions. Um, and I am very happy to have shared the evening with all of you. And, you know, all of you are an important part of this story. 